Hark the bardic paladin who sings and plays again. He tells the tales of glory and weaves a magic story. He'll join you at your table and ask you to share a fable. Heroes of humble origin, villains who must be fought again. No matter their skill or prowess, the people in life are countless. So we pray you heed our request. Enjoy this tale of sidekicks and sidequests. Sidequests and sidequests and sidequests. Episode 74, Jack Splash and Wayne, Underdark Tax Collectors. Welcome to Sidekicks and Side Quests, the Dungeons and Dragons podcast that helps to put humans back into humanity and breathe life into your campaign NPCs with backstory and bravado. That's right, we're building a world, one character at a time. I am your host, Kurt Krenwelge, the Bardic Paladin, and I'll be joining Gary Barker's table in the levitating platter. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of Sidekicks and Side Quests, the best unofficial Dungeons and Dragons podcast, in my humbly biased opinion. I've got an awesome guest lined up this week, but before we get to my guest, you know I like to leave you hanging with an ad read from our first sponsor, Plus One EXP. Tony Vicinda is the mastermind behind his mastercraft of beard balms, game design, and community building. He's got a beard balm named after all of the basic Dungeons and Dragons stats. Get a can, apply it to your face, and smell the sweet aroma and the sweet victory that comes along with increased strength, dexterity, charisma, and more. Beards and Beyond is the indie RPG that helped to launch this brand, but Tony's collaborated and developed several other projects, including Repugnant with Terrible Games iToaster, a brave little toaster-inspired TTRPG, and Down We Go, a game which seeks to capture the heart of old-school tabletop gaming. If you support Plus One EXP, either by buying something on their itch or website or going on Patreon and the like, it all helps funnel into the Plus One Forward program, which seeks to support additional indie tabletop content creators to continue making awesome stuff. I'd highly encourage you to follow Tony and Plus One EXPs on all the socials, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, in order to keep up with all the various projects that are being worked on, as well as upcoming interviews, one-shots, and actual plays of some of these awesome games. So, please go to plusonexp.com, use that affiliate code RANDOLPH when you're buying a beard bomb or a beard RPG, in order to get some savings on your purchase at no extra cost to you. Again, that code is RANDOLPH at checkout on the website plusonexp.com. Well, hello, mystery guest. Would you like to uh, go ahead and introduce yourself to our lovely podcast audience tell us who you are and what is it that you do oh man uh let's see so i'm gary Meow. no wrong gary <laughs> i was waiting for it i always give everyone that option um no so i'm an engineer uh you know i know we don't see a lot of engineers playing D, &D but mm. here i am <laughs> yeah, so you and i knew a couple people in common we play games together uh i do my own podcast you know we're all over the place so yeah pretty much man games that's that's my thing board games tabletop just everything the mutual friends that we're speaking about are uh, my previous roommates and uh, former adventurer comrades of mine when i got my first foray into D D in fourth edition uh steve and steph who you know they used to be roommates with me we all shared a place together and that's where in our apartment is where we played our first ever uh, D D game which was a uh, good, exciting, fun times with the Winter Contingency Training Company was the name of our adventuring party. And uh, we rotated Dungeon Masters and we pretty much leveled up after every session. Uh, so we were able to get through, you know, quite a bit of uh, leveling up in the fourth edition system. So we had, we had a lot of fun and it, it was good times. So that's good. It's always nice seeing people who cut their teeth on the 12 hour combat to fourth edition. Mm hmm. Yeah, there were powers and uh, grinding and wait, did I add all my bonuses up and stuff like that? So yes, this podcast is pro fourth edition. So we're pro all the editions. All right. Uh, well, I feel like this is a gimme, but uh, do you currently or have you ever played Dungeons and Dragons before? Never in my life. Can you explain the concept, please? 
Oh, well, sure. There's dice, there's paper. <laughs> uh, yeah, man, I've played on and off probably since before I could read. My uncle, man, he used to run me through like these meat grinder dungeons. Whoa. Uh, when, when I was itty bitty baby, like back when they still had the VHS D&D stuff. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah that's definitely old school. <laughs> so, you know, played it then, dropped it for a while, picked it back up in college probably. And then they haven't stopped me since. Not so much on the actual D&D portion of it these days, but mm -hmm. tabletopping in general, I'm, I'm all for. And if I understand correctly, because I have dived into your podcast, because the one I'm listening to, it's not Dungeons and Dragons. It's another gaming system called 13th Age. It's different, but it's also cool. So there are mechanical things that are very interesting and unique to that system. And it makes listening to the podcast a little more exciting, a little more fast paced. Not like, okay, we're going to have to sit down and, you know, two hours later and now the combat's done and stuff like that. Yeah, man. So you mentioned fourth edition. I think fourth edition was like the first one that I really bought into. Like mm. I, I played third edition a lot. I played AD and D. I'm a huge fan of White Wolf, mm -hmm. but I would get like a core book here and there and that'd be it. But with fourth edition, I bought the entire set. Like anytime they announced a new book, bam, 50 bucks on the table, guaranteed. It's a hard sell getting a lot of modern gamers to play fourth edition because it's so different from what they're used to. Mm -hmm. But 13th Age was a couple of those designers who basically spent years playing and had their own set of house rules. Okay. And uh, just eventually put those to paper. They streamlined the fourth edition stuff. So a lot of the things you're familiar with are there. Powers with writers, depending on your builds, on your roles, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of the stuff that people are used to are taken out like skills. And it just is meant to sort of provide the same experience while streamlining it for both the players and the game master. Yeah, I think the thing that's most interesting as I've been listening to is the concept of this escalation dice. So like every round, the escalation dice goes up and it gives bonuses and activates different abilities and powers, not only for you, but also the bad guys. So it's not like a slog fest where you're like taking forever to get through combat. It's like ratcheting up the tension to, you know, give it more high stakes and to hopefully resolve it quicker. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, uh, you know, it basically guarantees like the players don't hit that. Oh, I roll a die. I miss. Mm -hmm. Nothing happens. Move on. Right. Uh, so they've added things like, you know, automatic damage on a miss. So you're always doing something. The escalation die that uh, Steve, as our bard, he's got a lot of escalation die. He messes around with it quite a bit. <laughs> uh, and he loves that thing. So, you know, it makes the players happy. It makes the combats faster. So I'm all for it. And it suits well for a podcast medium, certainly. Oh, yeah. It keeps our, our encounter time down. And honestly, if I were to go to any other D20 system, I would probably keep that as a house rule just to kind of give the same sense of excitement it brings. You know, spoilers for some of the later episodes, but there's actually mm -hmm. some, some enemies that come in that are able to use it as effectively as the players. Mm. And as a GM, it's always great looking up and just seeing looks of terror on the, <laughs> the players' faces as that die just clicks over to the maximum. Right. Yeah. I mean, dungeon masters, game masters were always concerned about like, man, I have this really cool bad guy, but he's going to get killed really super quick before he gets to use any of his cool powers. So yeah, this is definitely a mechanic. Uh, I know Matt Colville and MCDM Productions for fifth edition came up with the concept of action oriented monsters, but the escalation die tool is, uh, you know, something similar, which is really cool. So maybe hopefully that's something to explore. Uh, and your games to speed up combat if players are concerned with how long things are taking. So as we're continuing our discussion, you know, this podcast is called Sidekicks and Sidequests. So we like to ask, who is one of your favorite NPCs or sidekick characters, whether they're from an RPG, a video game, or maybe movie uh, or a television show or literature, history, etc.? cetera? And, and why is this character your favorite? So you'd kind of mentioned something like this when we, we first started talking about, you know, what your podcast is all about. And I put a lot of thought into it. I, I really did because there's so many. Mm -hmm. um, I used to devour our like local library would sell, you know, paperback TSR books for 10 cents a pop. Wow. So I used to just eat those things like candy. Mm -hmm. But without a doubt, I think my favorite has to be Jarl Axel. I'm not a fan of the Forgotten Realms. I think Drist is, and you know, sorry if it brings any any negativity on your podcast, but Drist <laughs> is one of the worst characters ever written. Ooh, hot takes, hot takes. Hot, hot take. <laughs> but uh, Jarlaxle is the first NPC I can remember 
those those old books used to have like little 20 page solo D D adventures in the back and I, I used to remember buying books specifically because i knew he would be in these like choose your own adventures that you could interact with he seems like a cool character i haven't uh, had a chance to play you know the uh, the dragon heist campaign or read any of uh, the dritz novels or anything like this to really truly appreciate jarlax so but he he sounds like a cool cat he sounds well he sounds interesting or infamous to say the least so I'm a I'm a huge uh, like spycraft guy. I, I love just any anything in, involving like the the trade, you know. Mm-hmm. And that guy has a, a utility belt that would make Batman jealous. Ooh, he uh, is like, oh, this completely an entirely unforeseen situation. Yeah, I got a I got a magic item for that. I have a contingency plan for that. Oh, let's activate this protocol now that this political thing has happened in the land. Yeah, there's that, and man, it's the attitude. That guy just walks in and is like, yeah, yeah, I know, you're, you've run the kingdom and Lolf and whatever. Here's what I have to say. And then he says it and just leaves, and they <laughs> let him. And uh, to the flip side of our podcast, what's been one of your favorite side quests, either from a RPG, video game, movie, television show, literature, etc.? And why has it been one of your favorite side quests? Again, I kind of thought about this for a while, and I, I have one, but literally just today something Mm -hmm. i I was playing a game and uh something replaced it oh okay i love random immersion in video games like you can have side quests that give you you know stat bumps or magic items whatever all day long and that's fine Mm -hmm. but just those quests that like their whole point is to immerse you in the world Mm -hmm. and again hot take (laughs) <laughs> uh cyberpunk 2077 i'm i'm an old school shadow run and cyber per- person so i've been playing through that I, I won't say uh won't give any spoilers but there's a a funeral in in that game and like that funeral had me on the verge of tears just because all you were doing was going around like looking at said person's things and just reminiscing about them and you get literally nothing out of it other than having done the thing gone to the funeral and it was such a good moment so you're learning more about some of the other characters in attendance of the funeral in relation to this character that's passed away. Correct. And it's one of those where you kind of like with any, uh, you know, any companion in, in a video game, like, you know, about them, mm-hmm. your character knows them, mm-hmm. but this was that sort of like, yeah, you knew them, but you didn't really know them. Yes. I, you didn't know that really this hardened criminal actually took most of their money and gave it to orphans. Yeah, I love that sort of thing. And it it was one of those, like, I could see my girlfriend peeking over the back of the couch at me and I'm like, I'm not crying. (laughs) It's it's just, it's, there's something in my eye. It's like the Rutger Hauer, Roy Batty monologue at the end of uh, original Blade Runner. All those moments lost like tears and rain. You know, I I hated that movie as a kid. Really? And yeah, like it was a pretty movie, but I I hated it. And then I I grew up and rewatched it. And I was like, I was a dumb, dumb little child. (laughs) It's kind of different to watch. Like it very much is film noir. And then the the newer one came out from Denis Villeneuve. uh, And that one's like more straight up like, okay, it's like thriller, science fiction-y and asking questions. But it's like the original one really isn't as fast and action paced as you remember it it's kind of like it really is like slow and asking these big philosophical kind of questions and stuff and i, I think that's the the reason why i didn't like it as a kid it's mm-hmm. like i i don't have time for that i want to see a gunfight and then of course we have our final question here of the personal interview section what are you passionate about and why uh so if you ask my girlfriend it's about collecting board games and she's entirely wrong. I don't have a problem. <laughs> uh, I have precisely That's what they all board. say. <laughs> I have precisely as many board games as I need. But for me, it's storytelling. Like when, when I was a kid, I had a pretty vivid imagination. And uh, now that I've actually found a medium through which I can share that with people, man, if I could do anything day and night, it would, it would be talk and tell stories. And my girlfriend hates it because like, I, I've never met a stranger. I'll just you know, if I'm out, let's start talking to people. Mm-hmm. And two hours later, she's like, okay, we, we got to go finish grocery shop. Like that can wait, get their number. It's fine. Yep. The thing where it's like, okay, bye. And then you talk for 20 more minutes in the parking lot. And then, okay, we really have to go now. And then it's another 20 minutes. And then, okay, now we're starting the engines and driving away. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's it's uh, it's bad in public. It's terrible in private, especially with the podcast, because I love telling stories and I love to please people. So I'm like, oh, man, it's 11 o'clock. We guys, we should probably wrap it up. Mm-hmm. And I look around the table and there's four people going, but but what happens next? You'll just have to wait till next time. Yeah, but see, I, I can't tell them that. Oh, I, I got to be like, well, all right, let's sit down for two more hours. <laughs> Well, awesome. Well, this has been a great first section of the podcast of getting to learn more about my guest, Mr. Gary. And now I think it's time we head into some NPC creation. So NPC creation is brought to you by you. And at the time of this recording, I am very happy to report to you that the Patreon has worked. We have our first ever official patron of the podcast our previous guest herself goblin katie katie downey so this is the part where you can't see this listener but i have my beer here and so i'm going to lift it up in a loud hurrah and give her a public cheers thank you so much for not only being an awesome guest on this show but for saying how much you love the podcast you want to support us and continue to see us grow and make awesome changes and improvements along the way so cheers to you and uh you can be like katie and support the podcast as well we got different reward tiers at one dollar two dollars or four dollars a month it's probably the cheapest patreon account you'll find out there so if you want more information check the show notes or go to the website patreon.com forward slash sidekicks and side quests all right mr gary so I believe before we started rolling, you elected the way of randomization and chance. Is that correct? Yeah. What, uh, what's life without a little chaos? Yeah. So you've got your dice at the ready. And the first question that we have to ask ourselves is, what is our character's name? And if you would like to grab your D20 and give that a roll. Uh, let's see. I got 17. 17. Okay. Your answer was provided by previous guest Will Murray, a.k.a. the co-creator of Squirrel Girl from Marvel Comics. Jack Splash is the name of the character. Let's see. The next question we have here is, what is the ancestry of this character? If you would like to go ahead and roll 2d10 for a d100 effect. Let's see. Let's see. I got to pick out... uh, Appropriately blue dice, I think, for for a man named Splash. Yeah. I got a 13, a whole 13, 100 options. You'll be surprised to learn that Jack Splash is a manticore. Interesting. All right. Let's see. The next question we have here is, what is the job or role in society for Jack Splash, the manticore? Let's roll a D10, just a singular one, to figure out what is their occupation. Oh, this can only be good. How about a seven? Seven. (laughs) Okay. Your answer was provided by previous guest, the Royal Tut, tax collector, Jack Splash, tax collector, and is a manticore. You know, it's hard to, hard to say no to the man when he comes to pick up your taxes. How old is our character? Let's go ahead and roll a D8 for the age range. How about a three? Three is young adult. So a young adult manticore tax collector named Jack Splash. And so we now get to take a pause, a break from rolling dice, because now our question is, describe the physical appearance of your character. So when we hear the name Jack Splash, and then we see a manticore tax collector that's a young adult, what are we actually picturing? I'm actually going to go a little bit different here. Okay. So uh, Jack Splash is not a tax collector by choice. Oh, okay. Yeah, he is, let's say, a uh, tax collector's pet question mark that's used for intimidating the money out of people oh okay he's called jack splash because he's uh we'll say sort of albino ish and that he's got all white fur okay tax collector purposefully splashes red paint on him and lets it dry to look like blood to scare the hell out of anybody who won't pay his money Oh, I'm wondering if we need to go back through kind of a second time to at least maybe the first two as far as name and ancestry. So since we've already figured out that Jack Splash is the name of a manticore 
servitor, I suppose, of the main tax collector. So maybe we can figure out who is, you know, the person in charge, the boss of Jack Splash, if you will. So if you wanted to roll like another D20 and another 2D10, we could maybe see the name of the boss. Let's see. For the D20, I've got an 18. Okay. So this answer provided by previous guest, Justin K. Wayne, W-A-Y-N-E, just Wayne is their name. And then another D100 roll for the ancestry. It was 46. 46. Also a manticore. Actually, uh, according to this, it says Grimlock. Oh. Ah, so Underdark. Okay. Yeah, if I recall, they're a blind cave troll kind of thing. Okay. According to the Forgotten Realms wiki page that I'm looking at, it says the degenerated descendants of humans who had wandered into the depths of the Underdark centuries ago. And it looks like, let's see, slightly scaled, thick gray skin, usually scarred from hunts. Um, special status in their society often had decorative designs scarred into their skin. Sharp teeth, typically black hair, long and unkempt. Many had long claw-like nails. Some were said to have completely white eyes, while other accounts told of their faces being devoid of eyes, instead having skin stretching across where their eye sockets should be. Typically wore little clothing or armor, though some were known to sport tanned leather belts and harnesses, as well as decorative bracers. Okay. Perfect. Blunt and suspicious. Okay, so these guys sound like bad mamma jammy that you yeah they have blind sight they live in the underdark they do speak common and under common and dwarven and gnome and draconic okay so you could... so e- even even better like per our earlier conversation mm-hmm. tax collector for the exiled drow from the the main uh, what is it uh, menzo bronson so this tax collector wayne the grimlock is actually uh working for this exiled city or he works for the drow that are in this drow city no, ind- independent gives loans at horrible rates to, to the exiles so they don't have to go back. Oh, okay. So another separate community. And then Wayne, the Grimlock, just happens to be the tax collector slash protection, I guess, in this uh, other community uh, where drow who have left the lawful evil drow society can live, but at the cost of their wages and their treasures and stuff. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah, it does say typically grimlocks are neutral evil so that kind of fits in as far as a uh, <laughs> a motivation for just being like just give me all your stuff you know i'll protect you or whatever but yeah give me all, give me all your stuff okay so, so so no great change from the the tax collectors on the the, the upper world huh? two things in life are certain death and taxes and with wayne you're probably going to get both of them hopefully in that order <laughs> All right, so we know that Jack Splash is an albino manticore that Wayne here splashes blood or paint or something on Jack Splash to make him uh, look more fearsome and intimidating. Is it a rather good relationship between Wayne and Jack Splash? You know, let me let me look here. Let me pull up a manticore real quick. Yeah. Uh, they've got a pretty good perception. So I'm going to say probably not because... I can imagine Grimlock stink to high heaven. Uh, so, you know, it probably sticks around for the food, sticks around for, uh, you know, whatever he's got to do. But uh, more than that, you know, he, he probably stays away, keep, keeps his own nest somewhere. So is it a, a willing employment or does Wayne have something on Jack Splash, as it were, maybe? Because I feel like, you know, even just looking at the challenge ratings, a Manticore is a challenge rating three, whereas a Grimlock is a challenge rating a fourth. So it seems like on the surface that there's no way that Wayne should be able to handle Jack Splash on his own, but yet there's some sort of relationship between the two that's keeping that going. So I I think probably what happened is, you know, as part of one of these tributes that Wayne got, he Mm -hmm. he got this, uh, this manticore egg. Okay. Manticores come from eggs. That seems reasonable. And uh, growing up training Jack Splash, sort of okay. browbeat him into submission. Okay. But now Jack is getting a little bit bigger, a little bit meaner. Mm-hmm. Probably getting to that tiffing point where like one wrong move on Wayne's part and he's just going to get torn apart. We definitely know that Wayne is not a good caretaker, as it were. Maybe kind of brutish and just not very nice, to say the least. No, probably probably not. Uh, aside from just like who wants to associate with the, with the tax collector anyway. It's the Underdark. He's mean. 
everyone's but, fighting for survival. Someone's yeah, gonna, gonna serve say, someone. You know, at some point, Jack probably knows that Wayne is gonna turn on him when something runs out and food runs thin. And Wayne and Jack Splash, are they then the top of the food chain, as it were, in this independent community? Or do they in turn serve someone else? I'd say they well, they probably think they're the top of the food chain okay. because they haven't come across anybody else. Okay. So this really is kind of like a tiny enclave, and they're the two biggest things that uh, the other smaller or maybe less powerful or less prone to violent action just kind of put up with as far as like, well, you know, they do scare off all the other meaner, tougher things that would come and bother us, but at the expense of like, okay, well, you know, they're always asking us for treasure or food or something but you know it's kind of like this tenuous relationship between the protection and the normal people yeah yeah so i'll give i'll give wayne one more embellishment which is he actually carries a uh, walking stick that's got the hooks from a hook horror on either end so he can you know he's he's pretty quick on his feet he can make that claim like look we took care of the hook horror that was terrorizing you guys so that's why you should pay us Mm. Okay, so he's always kind of rubbing it in their face when they're like, you know what, Wayne, we don't like you. And then he's quick to remind them and Jack Splash too. They're like, okay, fine. Here, here's your food. Here's your money. Here's your treasure. Yeah. I mean, even if it was just like something he happened to find, I, I will give Wayne that. He's probably real quick on his feet for Grimlock. Okay. Uh, to, to have picked up this game instead of just, you know, bludgeoning everybody to death. Do you have any other physical descriptions? I guess now it's a pair of characters that we're creating. Do you have any other physical descriptions in mind for either Wayne or Jack Splash? So Jack is kind of albino. He does have those, um, if you've ever seen like ferrets or some of the bats where they have the eyes that gleam red in the Mm -hmm. dark. So he's probably got those kind of weird, scary eyes. If uh, his tail is probably, instead of just being like a weird bushel of nettles, I'd like to think it's, it looks like kind of a single, like almost like a scorpion tail. Okay, so kind of more the traditional sort of uh, mythology of the manticore. Yeah, and, and then, you know, if he, you know, needs to, he can split some of that off to, to fling at people. Ooh, interesting. Okay. But no, I, I think the lion body and face, the, the sort of bat wings, He's not really, aside from being an albino, probably indicates he comes from the surface because albinism is not really that common in the, the cave ecosystem, I think. Yeah, otherwise for him, I think that's good. For for Wayne, I actually think it's it's funny. In my head, I see this very like horrendous, smelly, ugly creature, mm-hmm. but he's wearing drow finery because that's what he took from- From all the drow? Yeah, so he's got like these very nice regal cloaks. He doesn't appreciate them. Mm-hmm. He's probably got like three hats on. <laughs> Uh, men and women's clothing doesn't matter to him right does he actually just have like these milky white eyes is his skin just kind of grown over where his eye socket should be yeah see that one's more horrifying to me like i would think having no eyes just these empty sockets with the skin grown over yeah you you look out your window and there's this this horrendous creature with no face basically i would be more inclined to give that guy some money And then let's see, I guess technically for both characters, describe each of them with three adjectives. Oh, with three adjectives. So let's see, we'll start with Wayne, I think. Uh, So he's going to be lanky. He is going to be, I I really do want to play up the uh, horror aspect of this guy. Because in the Underdark, you got to be the baddest of bad too. I'm going to say he's abominable. Abominable. Okay. And uh, say he has a good sense of bravado. Some of his intimidation is made up by just stuff he's found. So he, he's probably got to be pretty, I said it, probably pretty quick on his feet. As far as Jack Splash goes, uh, we'll, we'll say uh, massive. It's got to be getting, if he's a, what'd you say he was, a CR4? CR3 is what the monster manual says a standard manticore is. So yeah, I, I'd say massive. Uh, I would say downy. He's probably got like super fine fur. And let's go with occasionally adorable like when when he uh when he curls up to sleep at night you know wraps his wings around him Mm -hmm. comparatively to some of the things that the drow have seen in in the underdark Mm -hmm. it's just a a downright cute ball of fluff until someone tells them what he's about it's like you know having this big scary dog but uh you know the big scary dog can also talk uh with an intelligence of seven but the grimlock i don't know how much more intelligent a grimlock is than a manticore but i feel like they're probably on par you know pretty close to each other grimlock's got a nine oh yeah so he's oh wayne is way smarter than jack splash 
Oh, okay. So that's how he's able to kind of keep Jack from like realizing like, oh, you're actually bigger and stronger than me. Uh, Wayne is probably a pretty fast talker. So maybe he actively confuses Jack Splash. Yeah, telling him like, oh, but if you leave me, you won't have any food and stuff like that. And then Jack is like, oh, I like food. Either that or, you know, when when Jack is going to finally take him down, he just launches into some uh, rendition of elven physics that Wayne has picked up from a book. And Mm -hmm. Jack is just so confused by it, he forgets that he was going to attack in the first place. We need to figure out what's going to be a valuable item, piece of lore, a secret, or an ideal or concept that each of these characters ascribes to. So it's a combination roll of a D4 for the category and then a D6 for the actual selection. So if you want to roll for each of them, we'll figure out what that valuable is. All right. So for Jack, we've got a category of three and an item of four. So Jack Splash got secret. And this was submitted by our previous guest, Brady Effler. Apparently, Jack Splash is secretly farming mushrooms as psychedelics. That's interesting. I wonder how Jack managed to do that. Is it just like, oh, I just happened to find these underdark mushrooms. You know, they're funny. You know, they make me see strange colors and stuff like that. Like maybe Jack doesn't really know any better. Uh, And so he kind of keeps these secrets away from Wayne. So he doesn't find his tasty food or anything like that. So uh, let's say that after a group of these drow didn't want to pay their taxes, Jack put them in the ground, came back to eat them. Let's say like a week or two later and found all these mushrooms growing out of their bodies. Oh, okay. So uh, the psychedelics are probably something he's, just starting to experiment with oh. he doesn't want to take it to wayne because wayne takes away all his fun toys okay and then for wayne what's his uh, valuable item so we've got a two and a six two and six okay so this answer was provided by previous guest darby pack he knows the location of an old ruin is it like an old outpost or something like that? You know, something on a forgotten, oh, winding tunnel or something like that that he happened to find. And, oh, that's where I that's where I keep all my good stuff. Or, you know, I know I can go there and get good stuff if, uh, you know, I can't find any good stuff with these people. So Wayne knows the location of an old ruin that happens to be, uh, so the, the surface dwarves make treks down into the Underdark pretty frequently he finds the ruin of an old dwarven restaurant. So they, they had tried to make a, like a settlement or a base or something. Let's say it's got a, uh, an old broken dwarven keg that never seems to run out of alcohol. Ooh, an endless keg of dwarven ale. Yeah, you can't get much out of it, but... Oh, it's, it's broken, but it still works? Yeah, so it might only give you like a cup a day. Oh, okay, interesting. But, you know, sometimes it's enough. Okay, that's pretty cool. What's a particular quest that both of them together would be willing to recruit or hire player characters? Or do each one of them have their own separate side quest that they'd be willing to offer up? We can roll for that randomly, or if you're inspired, you can kind of organically generate that side quest. I think they would each have their own quest. So I think Wayne's would be, he would hire the party to find him a mate for Jack. Oh, if only okay. because Jack is getting too big, so he wants another baby one to train. Okay. And I think Jack would, you know, he's been farming these psychedelic mushrooms. Mm-hmm. He's bound to have seen some stuff <laughs> that he, with his seven intelligence, doesn't quite understand. <laughs> I think yeah. he would hire the party to take the mushrooms and go on a, go on a vision quest <sighs> with them. All right, we're going to take some peyote and wander the desert. Even worse, you're going to wander the Underdark. Oh, no. Oh, no. What you think is like something harmless is actually the maw of some awful creature. I mean, it's, it's one of those like weird Skyrim quests where the players are going to black out and they're going to end up being uh, fr- like best friends with some secret, horrible Underdark god that they have just met while it's supremely high. Blip dual poop. We've now been accepted by a tribe of Koatua fish people, and we're now uh, priests of Blipdool Poop. I, I think that would be the perfect intro, is uh, let, let them have their hangover moment where they have to retrace their steps. Ooh, that would be a fun side quest. Okay, he's like, take these mushrooms. They make me see funny, interesting things, but I don't know what they mean. 
safety tools. Make sure you talk to your party uh, that they're okay with this kind of a side quest. But it, you could have a very fun hangover type situation uh, where then the party has to retrace the events, piece their previous adventure together and figure out exactly what's happened. You know, we had, we had kind of talked earlier about the uh, the escalation die. Mm -hmm. one, of, one of the other tools I use is called the, the X card or the red card. Mm -hmm. that I shamelessly stole from Exalted because Exalted has a lot of non-consent problems. Okay. Um, but it is effectively like if you are, your players or the GM is ever in a situation where they're just uncomfortable or they don't want to follow that line of thought, they just hold up the card and it stops. No questions asked, no guilt or like, oh, but I, I had this thing planned. It's like, your players don't want to do that. We're not going to do that. Exactly. So that'd be a, a great tool to use for that. So definitely talk it over with your group and your players beforehand uh, trying to deploy this. Don't spring it on them, certainly. You'd have the option then of like, okay, do you want to do the side quest of actually exploring and piecing out what exactly happened? Or kind of like a Nuka Shine situation, like you start seeing all the funny colors and, you know, woo, and things are going crazy. Then it blacks out uh, and then you end up in a strange, unique location. And you can see there's like other bottles of Nuka Shine all around. The idea being that, hey, you had a wild and crazy time, you blacked out, and then you ended up in another part of the map. So it could be maybe something like that. Maybe, you know, not so much of like, oh, now we're, you know, clerics of this, you know, Koatoa society. It could just be a fun, interesting mechanic to help your players explore new and different parts of the Underdark that maybe they would not have otherwise been able to access. Maybe eventually over time they could have stumbled across it, but it would have taken them like a lot longer, you know, by not doing the psychedelics. They would have had to like explore deliberately through the Underdark to like find this place or something, you think. Does, does that sound... So, something I've done previously was, uh, and you can ask Steve and Steph how frustrating this is. They, they love it, but it's frustrating. Mm -hmm. uh, was basically I gave them the blackout and I was like, in a, in a nutshell, here is what happened to you over the course of that time period. Okay. Your characters do not remember any of it. And then they just keep meeting NPCs from that point in time okay. from when they were incapacitated who remember, like all, they're telling them these grand stories about their characters. Okay. They just never remember it. So they're having to rely on NPCs going, oh, that was a crazy time. You should have been there. Oh, wait, you were there. You were the you were the life of the party. Oh, okay. That could be a fun, fun way to do it. Again, talking with your players beforehand. It's like, oh yeah, you know, you threw a crazy party in the town and you even did something outlandish or heroic or, you know, something of the stuff of legends. Like you single-handedly fought a hook horror um, and you defended the entire town. Or something like that you know it could be something cool like that but then they don't remember actually doing it but they still get the experience of having done it in the form of like experience points or like a cool item or something like that shows up in their inventory maybe something like that that would be the perfect level up moment which is you know they come in as brand new level one characters uh -huh. go out at night wake up their level two and then everyone's telling these cool stories about what they did Okay, I kind of like that as a fun way. So we're not, you know, potentially going into a dangerous territory. And as both Gary and I have stated, we don't condone that, you know, unless you talk about it beforehand. That could be a fun way to do it as far as like something cool and epic happens to the party when they take the mushrooms, but they just don't remember. And they have to rely on the local NPCs or whoever to tell them exactly what happened. But now we have to consider the consequences from these side quests. So from Wayne and from Jack Splash, respectively. So what is going to be the reward for success in either quest? So uh, for Wayne, like I said, he thinks he's the, the biggest guy on the block, smartest guy mm -hmm. uh, in the room. I, I think he is going to be like, oh, I've stashed your, uh, your reward in this cave. So nobody will go get it. That's where I keep all my cool stuff. You can mm -hmm. go pick whatever you want from out of there. And the, he will just send the party into the jaws of some gigantic worm or uh, Ooh, some treachery. Like yeah, like a like an underdark anglerfish that has a like a gold jewel, a golden gem, or something mm -hmm. as its uh, as its bait to draw him in. If he sees the party do something that he's not able to do, he would he would send them off to die. But the plus side is, you know, if they're actually able to make it out, they they do find something down the gullet of this uh, this worm. That could be a whole dungeon unto itself. So this thing eats the party. Mm -hmm. It's too big to actually, you know, chomp them down and, and tear them apart. But on the inside, there's, I don't know, like a colony of oozes or something. 
it was Gears of War 2 when it was like the giant worms that were going underneath the cities. And at one part in Gears of War 2, you know, the city was being eaten by this giant worm. And so you were having to like traverse through the city that was being digested in the worm. And you were having to like chainsaw bayonet the different arteries and stuff like that in order to kill the worm from the inside. Something like that would be pretty cool. Yeah, it would, it would uh, I guess in that case, the the reward would be another quest or, or a, like a dungeon to, to go through. Okay, so then uh, kind of like a Sarlacc, you're just slowly, very slowly now being digested by this gigantic worm that you crawled into. But if you manage to kill it from the inside, you know, that's a legendary feat and there's probably all sorts of cool treasure and other monsters and stuff that are inside as well, also struggling to survive and whatnot. And then you'll probably also rid the Underdark of this legendary awful beastie that uh, probably the small community in the first place was uh, trying to escape its wrath and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Okay. And so then as far as Jack Splash is concerned, if the party eats the mushrooms, they have their uh, their fun Nuka Shine moment of doing something cool and heroic and getting, you know, something, whether it's a level up or some cool item or some cool story that uh, the NPCs of the town or wherever are going to tell them about in retrospect, uh, what's going to be the reward from that? So I would like to think that there's the higher Manticore power and, uh, you know, Jack is... Uh, Let's say he, through the course of of this psychedelic mushroom quest, mm-hmm. ends up being, you know, some kind of spirit caller or or druid or uh, cleric of these uh, psychedelics to actually have a vision quest, gain some uh, wisdom. I, I'd like to think he's able to give the uh, give the group their own set of sort of spectral manticores to ride. Ooh, that's cool. So then they can they're just able to somehow summon these spectral manticores to kind of help them out or or something like that yeah they're just able to you know it's it's jack so uh it's got to have some sort of ridiculously silly magic word or you know that that actually might be it kind of how they had the uh the serial killer uh rhymes in victorian london okay uh, jack splash would you know through this quest have ascended into kind of folklore on his own so you have to you have to say the the rhyme of Jack Splash to summon forth these, you know, these manticore spirits to help. Players take these psychedelic mushrooms. They go on their own sort of vision quest. Are they partaking them alongside Jack Splash? So it's like the players are like having the adventure with Jack Splash. And through the course of that, that's how Jack is able to ascend to this higher level of understanding beyond his seven intelligence and then escapes wayne and the underdark overall yeah you know he he becomes like the the primal manticore some something the group does like it starts off i'd say this quest in my mind's eye you know it's like a 10-part quest that starts off very silly like jack has them uh i don't know go get all of the shoes in town because that's how he wants to collect taxes this time but you know everyone sees the shoes sort of running away on their own uh, because of the mushrooms and by the end it's actually like him going through this deeply transmutative experience where he questions everything about his life and in in that moment he ascends to a higher plane he becomes like a, a deity figure or something yeah whoa (laughs) it's like congratulations party you have unlocked me from my mortal form and i now ascend to the higher realms but you know it's got to be one of those things where at the end of it the group is really questioning whether he was real the whole time or whether it it was just the mushrooms all right so now it seems like the quest is more from instead of the blackout thing you're doing these silly things maybe during the time while you're on the effects And so it's you on the trip. And so you're doing these silly things for Jack and Jack's learning and understanding. And then by the end of it, okay, boom, he triggers, ascends or whatnot. And then you learn the rhyme and that's how you're able to summon like a pair of spectral manticores or just a single spectral manticore. Yeah. I I mean, I I think I'd like to keep the whole blacking out thing and it would be people uh, discovering, you know, having to backtrack and go through what they did with Jack. Oh, okay. Because Jack is gone when they wake up. Like he's there, hires them to to eat the mushrooms, and then he's gone and everyone's telling all these stories. Okay. How long does that last? And how long does it take to recharge? Let's see. It's it's Jack. So I think it would be, uh, it wouldn't be a combat thing. Okay. I think it would be for a specific command. 
So out of combat, you would say, go get an item or fly me to a place or, you know, one thing, because that's kind of how he worked under Wayne. Okay. Because Wayne would give him a command, he would go do that thing. So I would say once per day, it could accommodate pretty much like one command you could give him involving the whole party, like everyone who was involved mm-hmm. uh, in, in the series of quests. So you can summon the spectral Jack Splash once a day, ask him to help you with a single thing, and then once he's done, poof, he disappears, and then you have to wait like another day before you can do it again, or you have to wait a couple days or something. Yeah, or we'll, we'll give it the caveat of you can always recharge it by going on another vision <laughs> quest. Okay, so then it's another session of like blacking out and then... Oh, did you hear the heroic, crazy, cool thing you guys did this time? You stopped a Tarrasque from rising up from underneath the earth. I'm a fan of uh, subverting expectations. Okay. So maybe like once or twice that would be the thing. But then if, you know, it was abused, I would have to start putting in some darker rumors or something that's entirely out of character. Like they're starting to have some bad trips and now they're doing bad things. Yeah. Again, talk to your players, figure out, you know, what those lines and veils are and all that good stuff so it doesn't get problematic. And so then we also have to consider uh, the failure for both quests. Oh, I guess we already figured it out for Wayne. Is he still going to send them to that giant mythic purple worm or whatever for them to get swallowed by? Or is Wayne just going to get mad when they don't return with a mate for Jack Splash? Because the fact that they're in the Underdark and Manticores, I don't know, are native to the Underdark or not, but it sounds like it might take some doing to go accomplish that one. Yeah, so that's a big quest. Especially if you go talk to Wayne, he's like, okay, find a mate for Jack Splash, great. Then you go talk to Jack Splash, and it's like, hey, take these drugs, and then secretly I'll ascend to Manticore deity hood or something like that. Then Wayne gets upset. It almost seems like you'd auto-fail because it's like, Jack Splash is gone. I don't have a mate for him. I, I want to say, like I said, I love subverting expectations. So I think actually, if you came back to Wayne, if that was a, a thing like you knew you were going to fail, I would like to think the party is self-aware enough to just be like, ah, it's not worth going back. Okay. But if you go back, he's going to be like, oh, well, clearly you're dumber than I am. I have a position for you and hires you on as tax collect offers to hire you on as tax collectors. To, re- to replace Jack, who has mysteriously gone missing during his quest line. So really, if you fail his, what you get is an insult, which is like, you're not good enough to be adventurers. Just come work the poor folk with me. And probably going to be as every bit of a taskmaster and unruly and not nice. Uh, and I imagine that this Wayne character is not a challenge rating one-fourth. He's probably beefed up. Unless he is a normal challenge rating one-fourth, it's just everyone was scared of him because of uh, the fact that Jack Splash was there too. Yeah, see, I I think he would actually not be a challenge. He he wouldn't scale with the party in any way. So, you know, they go have this grand adventure, come back three levels later, and he's still just as weak and is just full of bluster and using that to try and control them. Okay, so he offers an insult by offering to hire them as his uh, stooges for tax collecting these poor folk. And the party could obviously overtake him and then free these people from their subjugation, essentially. Yeah, if the party came back because they wanted to stay in the, the Underdark for some reason, it would be a good opening for them to start making a base. The tagline is uh, the safest place in the Underdark with the, the subheader of not that that's saying much. Uh, let's see, Jack. Yeah, how how would you fail Jack? You don't eat the mushrooms? You could either not eat the mushrooms, mm-hmm. which, you know, he'd go do his thing on his own, or you could eat the mushrooms, tell Wayne about it, at which point, you know, Wayne goes on his own vision quest, and we'll say it leads him to like a colony of Grimlocks. Oh. Side with Wayne and take over the town, or you have to fight an army of Grimlocks now that he's... Reunited with his people? Yeah. The neighborhood's gone to Grimlocks. <laughs> that's okay. that's got to go in the in the lexicon. You've gone to Grimlocks. So now I think it's time to test our might, test our metal in something we like to call the random encounter. This random encounter is brought to you by Reaper Miniatures. They've been Texas Titans of the tabletop industry since 1994. 
They're right here in my backyard of DFW, and they've got an amazing warehouse and game store. They make everything from paints to gaming accessories, and they stream on Twitch and YouTube with tutorials and interviews. Whatever system you're running, whatever game you're playing, Reaper has a miniature for you. Every time you shop and spend money with them, I believe at least $40, $50 on your purchase, they are going to throw in a cool free mini of the month. And it's always something new, so all the more incentive and reason to shop with them often. If you visit my website or you check out the show notes below, you can find an affiliate link so that when you go and shop on Reaper Miniatures website, you're actually supporting Sidekicks and SideQuests. By clicking that link, um, you're helping to track the traffic between our two websites and thereby helping our powers combine. Go on over, check out the Reaper Miniatures website, and be sure to use my link to get all of those benefits and savings. I know I recently got a $50 gift card, and I did use a portion of it to get the brand new special mini they made, a little Kenku bird bard that's based off of the national bird of Ukraine. The cost of the mini is about 10 bucks, and $7.50 of it goes towards UNICEF allocated to relief efforts in Ukraine. So all the more reason to go check out that particular cool mini. Follow Reaper Miniatures on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Twitch, and YouTube. So this is the part where we like to do a little bit of role play, a little bit of a vignette. We have two characters to kind of interact with. And so I'm curious as to what kind of scene you're wanting to do. Is it going to be a scene of Wayne talking to Jack Splash? Freetown citizen talking with Wayne and Jack Splash? Is it an adventurer character talking to Wayne and Jack Splash? What are you thinking? Jack Splash, he's, he's got his secrets, obviously. I think it would be interesting for him to have found an adventurer out in the wild. We've got a small cavalcade of characters that you can choose from. So we have Duncan, who is the recklessly brave adventurer. He's happy-go-lucky, willing to do any side quest or task put before him. We have Sonia, the warrior woman, barbarian, multi-classed into paladin. We have Korak. He's the lawful, evil, arcane trickster rogue dwarf. And then we have a brand new character who's been on a hot streak as of late. Her name is Chrisley, and she is a wood elf from the Wode, this shy herbalist botanist who's on a quest. See the outside. Or if you want, we can create a whole brand new character. So what are you thinking? So, you know, the Underdark's a pretty, pretty grim place. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to see a happy-go-lucky character. So where we last left our hero Duncan, he was previously in the Astral Sea with Winston, the Gith Yankee miner. And then when he struck a particular mineral or precious metal on that uh, asteroid there, uh, the planetoid X there in the Astral Sea, it magically transported him to the docks of Waterdeep. And that's where he met Talon Urin. And uh, after completing the job, uh, inadvertently, he didn't know otherwise, for the Bragg and Darth, and he actually met Jarlaxle, who, you know, told him, like, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that, you know, you're not in the right world, but you know what? You know, this piece that you need, I think you can get it if you traverse into the Underdark. And Duncan has previously done adventures into the Underdark, and so he's like, all right, well, okay, fine. You know what? Uh, I'll do your deal. And uh, as soon as I get this last thing or this ingredient I need, then that should be able to get me home uh, back to my native realm. So he gets a direction, a boost from Jarlaxle and the Bragg and Darth, and he's able to make his way to the nearest entrance and start traversing down, down, down to Goblin Town, then past Goblin Town and further down into the Underdark. And it's before long, you know, Duncan is uh, in his element, adventuring, you know, charging forth when. I guess, where is Duncan going to stumble across uh, Jack Splash today? You know, Jack is, is trying to, to learn lessons from Wayne. So what does Wayne wear? He wears like all this really gaudy, silky clothing. Mm -hmm. So Jack Splash is probably trying to mine his own like bioluminescent gems. Okay. Uh, so, you know, he comes across uh, Duncan, who, who is looking for a specific mineral, just happens to look up and see this gigantic manticore like trying to delicately sliced pieces off of these rock formations and failing horribly because he's got just huge cat mitts. And Duncan will kind of freeze. He won't immediately reach for his weapon, but he'll be like, hello, are you friend or are you a foe? That depends. Jack will point at, we'll say a dagger on his belt. How are you with that? 
uh, Duncan will look down at the dagger and he'll say, oh, well, um, I, I am pretty handy when it comes to a weapon. Um, I, I'm not especially good with knife tricks, but I do. He'll pull it out and kind of brandish it, but in a non-threatening way. And he'll just be like, I do know how to use this. Uh, Jack will uh, effectively have like a hand sized hunk of this gym mm-hmm. and he'll have, you know, like a tiny worked drow gym and mm-hmm. he'll hold them both out to Duncan, mm-hmm. like make that with that and point at the dagger. Oh, okay. I do not have a jeweler's kit on me. So this will, this will take a considerable amount of time. Uh, but Duncan, you know, his fatal flaw being, he can't really refuse a task put before him. It's kind of that chaotic part of himself um but he'll i guess he'll kind of plop himself down and then uh he just kind of like sighs and shrugs and then he just kind of starts getting to work on it and i guess he'll sort of get a chit chat going along and be like well i've uh i don't think i've ever met a uh albino manticore before uh one as uh stylish and intelligent as you and but uh he kind of looks at the red splashes i guess on jack splash and is like um oh dear uh, you seem to be covered in something is that is that blood what what is that and he'll i guess he'll touch his hands to it if jack splash will let him and he'll smell it and what is he picking up is it pain is it blood or what is it yeah it's it's uh paint it's that really um what, what is it where you uh you take like the the solid the sandy pigments Mm-hmm. Uh, it's kind of just like that that has been smeared on him, so it's sticky. Yeah, he'll kind of like test it in between his fingers, and then he'll just kind of go like, Bleh, and kind of rub it on a rock. Just be like, what's what's going on with all of this? And what are you doing out here by yourself? That's Wayne. He insists. Oh, and and who is Wayne? Uh, he takes your things. No, oh, I take your things. He takes them from me. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I mean, is he a good friend to you jack just rolls over (laughs) oh serious no 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 oh i'm sorry to hear that everyone needs friends the big of us the small of us we all need friends oh yeah i got plenty of friends really interesting where are your friends oh uh in town he'll uh like go over to one of those weird mossy mushrooms and like wipe his tail in it Mm-hmm. So that the uh, the glowing, you know, fungus juice is on there. Mm-hmm. And he'll just kind of drape it over Duncan's shoulder so he can see a little bit better. Okay. And does that where if you've ever seen a cat like stand up and then wrap its tail around itself, he'll, mm-hmm. he'll do that. So you know, Duncan uncomfortably has this nine hundred pound creature just sitting over him. <laughs> And then I guess as he's uh, chipping away, I don't know how long it would actually take him, but for the sake of podcast story purposes will say that uh he gets a pretty rough approximation that i would imagine to jack splash's eyes would be close to identical and then uh duncan will hold it up and be like ah well how does how does this look does this suit your fancy it's the best i can do without the proper tools so uh jack will will take both of them hold them up and there's one that's clearly like professionally worked and formed and uh you know to his eye perfect spot on just, mm-hmm. that's great and he'll just hand duncan the original mm-hmm. and keep the the horribly flawed copy perfect and stick it uh, somewhere in his fur just kind of like stand up point mm-hmm. and there's a whole chunk of these rocks that uh that jack has knocked over mm-hmm. do it again oh okay are we gonna be doing this a lot saw you examining the rocks thought that's what you were here for well you're not wrong I do need to get some of this to get back home. Just reach over, grab a chunk of it, hand it to him. Is that enough? Yeah. Yeah, this would be great. But um, I don't know. I, I mean, you've already given me so much. And, you know, I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask if there was something that I could do for you. Oh, uh, leans in real close. How do you feel about seeing things? Well, Duncan will kind of chuckle and will start to talk about an adventure he had in the Feywild. And Jack Splash can either stop him or let him continue this long-winded tale about being in the Feywild and seeing all kinds of crazy things. I would imagine that's kind of like shining a, a laser light for a cat. <laughs> you know, Duncan is describing all these these cool Fey things, and uh, Jack has really only known the Underdark, so he will listen as long as, as long as Duncan will talk. So Duncan will ramble on for quite a while, and then he'll kind of end it and be like, 
And yeah, and so then through that, I you reunited the Narwhalicorns together, and now I have the ability to fly once a day. Narwhalicorns. That sounds magical. They are. They're quite majestic beasts. You know what else is magical? What? Jack will like shake and a, a bag will fall out of, we'll say off of one of his wings and he'll pry it open and inside of these uh, weird green and purple mushrooms. These can bring that experience here to you now. And uh, Duncan will reach down and pick up one, I guess, smell it and do a nature check. And uh, we'll say he gets a critical failure. He He's just like, these are strange and different. What do they do? And I don't know if a critical failure means he actually just kind of eats the mushroom in his examination of it, not realizing the potential dangers of uh, doing this. And so once, once Jack sees Duncan pick one, Jack will just take like a big handful out of the bag, eat them and just kind of roll over so that he's laying next to uh, to Duncan. Okay. You might want to hold on. Oh, and then <laughs> I guess very, it sounds like very quickly the effects start coming on. And so Duncan's going to be like, oh. From, from somewhere like music starts to trickle in. Jefferson uh, Airplanes White Rabbit or something like yeah, that. Je- Jefferson Airship. Oh no, uh, that's that's the uh, Faerun Halfling cover band. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, but that White Rabbit song starts playing. Brum, bum, brum, bum, bum, bum. So uh, Duncan's laying on the floor, hugging on to uh, the fur, and he. So like the things are wibbling and wobbling and warping, and Duncan's like, "Oh, this is much different than the Feywild." It gets even better up high. Jack will kind of like scoot over, uh-huh. hook him onto his wings and take off. Okay. And so then I guess begins the montage and then the morning comes. And then uh, I, the only way I could think to end it perfectly would be Duncan wakes up. He finds himself just on the edge of the city of Waterdeep. And he has this chunk of mineral that he was needing to complete the ritual to be able to get home. And then he looks down. I don't know. What's the remnant or what's the thing of uh, Jack Splash that Duncan would have to kind of remember him by? We'll say there's uh, probably just this gigantic uh, talon that's hooked through. Would be funny if uh, flying upside down, Duncan started to fall over and, you know, was losing his vest or losing his pants or something. Okay. So they had to replace the button with the only thing they had at the moment, which was just this talon that's hooked through. So he's got this weird like makeshift cuff link holding some piece of important clothing on. And then uh, I guess as he comes to, he gets flashes of memory, but he also has this pounding headache in his head, like a bad hangover that he's trying to recover from i guess it escapes his lips the rhyme or something that he remembers like it's the one thing that he can really truly remember um and i guess as he says the magic rhyme for jack splash uh all of a sudden this spectral version of uh, jack splash shows up and duncan like kind of rubs his eyes and does a double take and goes whoa hello jack jack splash jack splash that's your name i met you in the underdark yes the, the spirit of Jack will give him like a, a super dapper two-legged bow, spread his wings, and then seeing that there's no immediate need for him will disappear. What people see is like when they saw him in the Underdark, he was particularly brutish and unrefined. And now he's actually holding himself with a sense of grace and dexterity. And so then as the last bits of the spectral image of, uh, of this version of Jack Splash fade off, should Duncan ever find himself in the Forgotten Realms under dark, he'll have some explaining to do with Freetown. But otherwise, Duncan will take this hunk of mineral, head back to Jarlax on the Break and Darth to hopefully get his way back to our podcast world. In uh, times of trouble, the spirit of Jack Splash will come to him speaking words of wisdom. Let it be. That's it. And scene. Wow. That was cool. Yeah. So that was a fun way to do that scene. And, you know, we didn't have to worry about anything bad uh, happening to Duncan. And I think that was that was a very fun way to present that. Yeah, like I said, I, I love because if you if you read the Underdark sort of as presented in all the original novels, like it's this weird horror place that has these cool bubbles of safety. The few times that my players have been brave enough to decide they wanted to play in the Underdark, that's mm. kind of what we focused on. The points of light. Yeah, the points of light. So yeah, we're starting to get here into the final thoughts of the show. But yeah, what did you think of your 
random encounter. What did you think of your experience on sidekicks and side quests? I, uh, I like it. I uh, am sorry for inadvertently generating two characters instead of one, <laughs> but uh, you know, somewhere, someone across the multiverse will get to have Wayne the Grimlock as uh, an antagonist. I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, it could have gone any number of different ways in the random encounter, but that's how we did it. So the question is how you out there in uh, podcast land are going to use Wayne and Jack Splash in your game. Yeah, if you if someone does end up using either of these characters, please let Kurt or I know, because I would love to hear the story. I, I not only love telling stories, I love hearing stories. So, so I want to give you the soapbox, the platform, the stage uh, to speak. Let us know about that podcast, where we can find it, where we can stay in touch with you and to do all those things. So please, uh, the stage is yours. A couple of months ago. So I've, I've been gaming for ever and a day, like I said, I guess around October of 21, my players and I got together and decided, well, first it started as we're going to record our episodes. That way we have a reference. And then that evolved into, well, like I'm going to record the episodes and maybe some other stuff for a website. And then by the time it was all said and done, we'd all agreed on just making a podcast. So there are a billion and one real play podcasts out there. We are just one of them. I, I always say like, we're, we're doing this one mistake at a time where we're learning how to make a podcast. We're learning how to do a website. So we haven't really nailed down what all we're doing aside from we have a podcast that is a uh, real play. It's not fifth edition. Like you said, I'm very proud of that fact. Because while there are a billion real play podcasts, there's only like 50 that aren't D&D. So it's a, uh, a high fantasy game. We get to watch some super cool adventurers deal with timeline shenanigans as they're sent back in time to a point at which they had previously mucked things up. They get to do it all over again, but hopefully get it right this time. Technically, we finished recording the entirety of our season. So it's like 40, 40 odd episodes. Uh, okay. And it is, like I said, it's it's more of a traditional fantasy. I've pulled from a ton of, you know, my old notes and kind of pull them all together into this game world that we play. For one reason or another, this world has existed going on a decade now. And not only my current group, but other different groups that I've ran have played in this world. And it just so happens the last time this group ran in this world, they mm. broke the world. They broke physics, they broke magic, they broke everything due to some party choices. So we figured this would be a good time to give it the old uh, reboot and remaster and go through and you know their characters have the knowledge of their previous lives which are all the different games we played but now they're having to relive things over again you know quantum leap style hoping that this will be the, the time they get it right so you know we've got that some of my players are also gms so starting in june july of 22 uh, we've got one of our guys by the name of mike who's going to be taking over uh, steve wants to take a shot at at running some stuff and then uh, around the end of the year, we'll get back into the, the third season of the current game. Awesome. And then if we want to follow up on a website or socials, uh, where can we find all those? We've got a website, averageadventuringparty.weebly.com. Uh, we've got Twitter at Average Party, uh, Average underscore Party, I think. Everything else is either Average Adventuring Party or AAP Podcast. So Gmail, Patreon, like literally everything. Uh, so if you want to find us on there, if uh, you want to find us on Facebook, Spotify, we're all under the average adventuring party. Well, Gary, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to speak with me. I know we kind of, uh, we, we melded our DM GM brains together and we kind of went all over the place, but uh, we found that resolution here at the end of the show, uh, which I'm happy uh, that we arrived to a wonderful chaotic conclusion. And uh, I'm honored that uh, you came on the podcast and hopefully we can have you along with some of your other castmates, perhaps uh, pop on the show and make more characters to, to use in your games. Yeah. So, you know, if Doctor Who has taught me anything, it's that as long as the ending is fine, you can hand wave away any number of plot holes throughout the throughout <laughs> the runtime. So, yeah. And thanks for having me. I, I would love to come back. I know I, uh, when you invited me on here, I told a couple of my guys, and I know Steve and Mike would love a chance to jump on here and interview with you. So just let us know when you, uh, when you want them and we'll send them your way. Thank you for listening to this episode of Sidekicks and Side Quests. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, and Overcast. Or feel free to save the RSS feed to use the app of your choice. Visit our website, sidekicksandsidequests.com, for links 
write-ups of the NPCs, and to learn more about the show and the guests who have been on it. To stay up to date and interact via social media, you can follow the podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit by searching for Side KQ Podcast. I would love to talk D&D and showcase your fan art, stories of how you used our NPCs, discussions, and commentary. If you would like to hail the bod, simply send an email to sidekicksandsidequests at gmail.com. To help this show be the resource it's meant to be, I ask that you please leave a review on iTunes to help spread the word and share our podcast with your friends and family. Whether you're a veteran player or an aspiring dungeon master, or you've never played Dungeons and Dragons before, there's something here for everyone, and I want to hear about it. And finally, after two years, I've decided to open a Patreon for Sidekicks and Sidequests. If you love this podcast and you want to help us grow and expand our operations, I would appreciate it if you would go on over to patreon.com forward slash sidekicks and side quests. No matter your lifestyle expenses, we have wonderful rewards at every level of Patreon membership tier. Your name on the wall of the levitating platter, a loud hurrah on the podcast, or the possibility to introduce an element of chance to NPC creation. Sidekicks and Sidequests is unofficial fan content permitted under the fan content policy, meaning I'm not approved or endorsed by Wizards. Portions of the materials used are property Wizards of the Coast, copyright Wizards of the Coast, LLC. Thank you for your support, and I'll see you at the pub next time. Bar to rock on one, two, one, two, three, four!